Hey, good day, it's Preso. Thanks for stopping by. Now this is episode five of making a float lock vice for your drill press table. Now there is a playlist, it's up there now. Go back and check out the first four episodes if you're just stopping by for the first time today. Now in the previous episode, I showed you I had a bit of an issue with the alignment of the jaws in the vise, but I've resolved that and I'll show you how I did that. And in today's episode, I want to finish off the rest of the parts for the moving jaw. So there is a nut and a handle that we want to get done. And we might even make a start on the clamp at the other end of the bar. But let's have a closer look at the problem I had in the previous episode and how I fixed it. Everything's fixable. <laughs> in the previous episode, I was showing how I had a bit of a problem with these two jaws here and they were not aligning. Now in a float lock vise, this is really the fixed jaw and this is the clamping jaw or the moving jaw. Now although you can move that fixed jaw along the bar here, it does lock into position and then when you clamp the vise, this is the jaw that actually clamps up tight onto the work and onto this jaw here. Now I'm not really sure what went wrong, but uh, when I checked this for the straight edge and I was able to put that along the sides of the jaws there, they weren't aligned correctly. But now they are, and if I lay this flat on the bench, you can see how it is sitting dead flat. A bit of a clatter there, but it is actually sitting flat on the bench. Now, it didn't come without its own problems. I did have to make this pin here bigger. It was three millimeters, it's now 3.5, but that got rid of all of the alignment issues. Now, we'll go over the mill, I'll show you how I fixed it, and we'll look at the setup. So this is the setup that I came up with to remachine this pocket here. And remember this is already done and what you can see is that I've got the bar now inserted into this fixed jaw here. The jaw is clamped in the milling machine vise. At the other end of the bar there I've got a machinist jack and a toe clamp. That sort of holds everything rigid at that end. And I only had to take off about uh, 5 to 8 thou, I think it was about 0.25 of a millimetre of this surface here. And as I swept across there with this 12 millimeter carbide end mill, you could actually see it was machining more off one edge than the other. But that got me back to a position where this surface of the pocket is now perpendicular to this surface of the jaw. And that was the goal all along. And my advice to you is if you're copying what I'm doing, do this feature last. I actually did that first, then I machined the, the groove in the bar there. And also if you're doing this, put a threaded bolt down through this section of the casting here because there is a 10 millimeter thread in there. You could bottom that bolt out against the slot in the bar. That would hold it a little bit more rigid. As it turned out, there was a little bit of chatter there, but because it was such a light cut, I got away with it. Alrighty, so that's done. Now we're gonna head over to the lathe and we're gonna make the nut that threads onto this M12 thread here.
So that's the fit between the moving jaw and the nut. So we just want that to be a sort of a running fit. Doesn't have to be a precision fit at all. In fact, having a little bit loose is probably a good idea just to take up any misalignment between the threads. So uh, later on, it's going to need some cleaning up. The surface finish on the steel is pretty horrible, really. This is um, just really cheap, cold bending steel that I happen to have on hand. One of these days, I'll splash out and purchase some high quality steel. Something that you can you know, get a good surface finish on, it will hold close tolerance. But for now, this is what I've got. This is going to get parkerized later on, so even that sort of rough-ish sort of finish there won't really be visible with that parkerized surface on it. So this needs a groove now to take the 2mm pin, and that allows the nut to pull the jaw in and out. Well, this is the 2mm roll pin that's going to pull the jaw in and out and it sort of fits in some locations and other places it gets tight but I think that's the nature of roll pins they do expand and, and compress when you push them into the hole so that insert that I use is a 2mm insert 2mm pin so it should be okay I don't want to go any looser than that so it's going to chamfer everything now and this gets parted off and we're going to flip it around and do all the features at the other end That'll need some more work on the finish, but I'll do that later after I've finished this whole part, just in case I screw it up. <laughs> Alright, that part gets held in a collet now and we can do all the features on this end here. These are the chips that that carbide parting tool makes. But you can also see how brittle that cold rolled steel is. They just don't want to unravel. <laughs> cute little chips aren't they? Most of the lathe work is finished on this now, but it does need a large radius, uh, like convex face on the end of that part there. It's mainly cosmetic, but I guess it also takes away any tendency to have a sharp corner or a sharp edge on it. And later on, there does need to be a slot machined in here and a cross hole, but we'll do all of that on the mill. So I'm going to try and do this big convex face on there now. So I'm going to try using the Tornado to do this big convex on here and I've set the tool here to give me a radius of 18 millimeters 
and according to the information that Eccentric Engineering puts out on these tools, they say that they're only good on free cutting materials, so they suggest brass, aluminium, plastics and so on, and maybe free cutting steel. Now this is not free cutting steel, so it's every chance this will fail, <laughs> but we'll try it. If it doesn't work, I've got another tool that I can use. Wow, it looks like it's working. <laughs> so I'll keep going. Uh, it's one of full convex on that face there. All right, I'm calling that a success. Uh, that worked better than I thought. So just this morning, this turned up in the mail. Now this is the Tornado large radius shoe or large radius attachment. And the normal regular uh, Tornado turning tool can fit onto this. And it just slots in at the back there like that. And then you can set the radius with this little uh, fine adjustment here. And uh, then you can do your really big radii. Now this will do up to 120 millimeters in radius and it will do both internal and external radii and when I bought this unit I just bought the regular Tornado unit uh, the turning attachment which is this little shoe here and this top plate the bottom plate and the spacers then later on I bought the 2D copying attachment that goes on the back here and then just today I got this now I have got another spherical turning attachment but it's nowhere near as versatile as this unit here and uh, this tool, the large radius tool here, don't have any immediate need for it, but uh, I thought I'd just get it. And uh, it's the sort of thing you might use every you know, two years or three years, but when you do need it, <laughs> it's worth having. So um, just so you know, I pay full price for this. Uh, it's not sponsored, but I do think they're excellent tools. So I've got the nut sitting in a square collar block here, and we're set up over the center of that part. So I'm going to cut a 17mm deep slot by 6mm wide, probably do it in like 4mm passes. Uh, I think that slot drill is not the sharpest thing in the world, but that'll deburr up okay. So we'll put this in the vise horizontal now and drill the cross hole. So there's the nut finish for now and we need to get on and actually finish off the handle that fits into that slot. So this is the stock for the pivoting handle. It looks like this when it's finished. I'm just going to rough this out to its finished diameter and then we're going to go over the mill and machine some flats that will fit inside the slot of the nut. So I'm just going to rush through this. It's all pretty much plain turning.
It's got to have a hemispherical end on it before we go over to the mill. I'm going to use the Tornado to put the half round on the end of the stock here. So that material is 16 millimeters diameter and to set the Tornado turning tool I use this little fixture here. So this is just something I made up myself and I've got a set of laser cut and laser etched discs that can be screwed to the top of that fixture there. So I've got these both in Imperial and Metric. So I've got the 16 millimeter disc in there, that's 16 diameter, and then it's just a matter of putting the turning tool up against the surface of the disc there and you can adjust the position of the tool tip until it's just skimming that 16 millimeter disc there. And then put that back on the tornado and then rotate the tool to 90 degrees and just move the cross slide in until the tool tip is just touching the outside of the stock. And then when you start to cut, your feed is toward the headstock, so in the Z direction. You just take it in short increments until you get a full half round. Okay, that's pretty good. I uh, need to go over the mill now and machine off two flats either side of that. That will fit through the slot in the nut. I've got this set up in a square collet block and I need to machine a flat on the top and the bottom by flipping the square block over and I've got the spindle directly over the centre of what will be the pivot hole. So once I've machined the flats I'll drill a 4.1 millimetre hole through there for a 4 millimetre roll pin so the handle will pivot easily on that roll pin. Well, that's the fit that we're looking for. I do need to machine deeper in X, uh, like further on toward the collet here, so that we can pivot the handle all the way around. Okay, I'll deburr that and then this goes back on the lathe for the finishing operations on the profile at the other end of the handle. I 
badly want to put some tail stock support on this part because it's a bit flimsy. It's only being gripped by that 6mm flat up this end here in the forejaw. I've got to put an undercut just behind this 12mm diameter here and then a long taper up to this point here. Uh, it's going to look odd if I put a center drill in that face there so I'm just going to take some very light cuts and uh, put up with some chatter and then hopefully we can do some you know, finishing work later on and get rid of all those chatter marks. Even though I've got a drawing, I'm pretty much freestyling this. Uh, the only really important feature is the bit that's held back in the chuck. Everything else is just cosmetic. So the finish I've got from the carbide tool is terrible, uh, partly due to the quality of the steel, but also the way it's held in this chuck. It's, it's really not rigid enough. So I'm going to try and use high speed steel to finish off. Uh, I've got a couple of these diamond tool holders that will allow me to get into this neck and also the taper. And we'll just try and get the best finish we can and then it's just going to have to be emery cloth, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Uh, that just needs some cleaning up and I'll get the chamfers on here. Uh, I can just see myself ruining it. <laughs> if I get to dig in it'll just bend. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think that looks good. That's pretty much done. It does need a bit more work with some emery and scotch bright, but we're getting pretty close. So I'll finish that off camera and then we'll have a look at the assembly of this part, the nut, and the little uh, aluminium knob that I made. And who doesn't like a nice knob? Now I just realised I've got the opportunity to use this Tornado large radius attachment to machine this particular part here. Now this is a knob that allows you to reposition this fixed jaw here really quickly. Now I machine this mostly off camera. It came out of a comically misshapen piece of aluminium stock that I had lying in the scrap box. That's why it's set up in the four-door chuck and running eccentric. But I could get the diameter that I need from that. So we need to machine a very large convex face on that particular surface there. So I'll get this set up in the collet chuck and we'll do that. This part will get anodized later on. When you're using the Tornado in this configuration here there is a, an adjustable pivot point but in my case I've got it set up just here right on the edge of this large circular disc here and that's where the whole arrangement will pivot from and you need to set the radius that you want which in my case is 25.5 between the tip of the tool and that uh, pivot point there now it's not really important in this case to get it spot on so I'm just using a 25 millimeter wide rule to eyeball that get it roughly where I want it I can make minor adjustments as we go along though So that's roughly where my starting point is and we can just sweep across till we get the full convex on that face there and I, once again I'm feeding in toward the z-axis or toward the headstock.
All right, well that part's finished. Uh, I'm going to put that aside. This will get anodized right at the end. But just to finish up today's episode, I thought I'd show you all of the parts that I've made to this point. Now, what you can see on the screen at the moment is a float lock vise. The parts that I still need to make are the sections which anchor this bar down to the surface of the drill press table. And they're relatively simple parts. We'll do that in the next episode. So you can see here that I've assembled the pivoting handle onto the nut now and that rotates 180 degrees both ways and it's got a lovely smooth action. And at this point I have to admit with some degree of embarrassment that I had to make this nut twice. And here's the one that you saw me make on the video today and this is the replacement. So the reason why I did it again was that I ended up with what's called a drunken thread inside this part here. So a drunken thread is where the axis of the threaded feature doesn't align with the rest of the part. It could be caused by poor setup, uh, inappropriate uh, alignment of the tap when you start the thread, uh, excessive torque, blunt tap, uh, there's a whole host of reasons why that could have gone wrong. And what I did was I uh, ended up, uh, I just roughed out the nut, you know, just rough turned it, then I did the threaded feature and then I mounted it on a threaded mandrel. And you see here, it's mounted in the lathe. And once I had that mounted on the mandrel, I could clean up all of the remaining surfaces knowing that they would be concentric with the thread. So I should have done that right from the get-go, but, you know, <laughs> I was making videos. Now, I also made this brass washer off camera, and it fits over this section of the nut, and it uh, fits against the face of the moving jaw and just takes up any wear and tear against uh, those surfaces. Now, I also was able to purchase this uh, spring. So this compression spring fits into the end of the threaded uh, section on the bar, and that takes up any backlash in the nut when you open and close it. And this is the latch or the, uh, the spring-loaded pin. So this keeps the fixed jaw locked, and when you want to move the fixed jaw quickly to close it, it just ratchets up along the bar. But let me get this assembled and I'll show you what it looks like when it's all done and then we'll try it out just to see if we can clamp apart, I hope. <laughs> Alright, well that whole assembly only took about a minute and uh, all you need to do here is to insert the latch or the spring-loaded pin into the casting here in the fixed jaw, pull that latch up and then you slide it over either end of the bar, it doesn't matter which one and it slides out far enough to clear the section at the back of the bar here where there is no slot. So, uh, you yeah, know, just slide it on, let it go, and it will, you know, fit into the slot in the top of the bar there. Now with the moving jaw, all you need to do is to assemble the washer and the nut through this face of the casting here, and then thread it onto the section of the bar with that compression spring in place. And there are two pins which you can't see probably. This top pin here stops that jaw from rotating on the bar and this lower pin down here engages in a slot in the nut and that traps the nut in place there and it doesn't matter which way you turn it the jaw will move with it and uh, the greatest party trick with this particular type of float lock vise is the way you can quickly reposition this jaw so if you want to open it you just simply pull that knob and you slide it along the bar that way but if you want to close it you can just quickly ratchet along the bar like that now when you pull back, it sort of tends to lock into one of the pockets in the bottom of that slot there. Now there are other float lock vices that I've seen on YouTube, and although they work in a very, very similar way, they have a long acne thread. So there's a, a main bar and then another acne thread which operates the jaw. And in order to move the jaw a long way, you've got to crank the handle a lot <laughs> in order to move that jaw if you want to open it a long way. But this one here has this very quick action. So in reality, if you want to clamp a part like this one here, simply place it against the what is essentially the moving jaw, and then just ratchet this one up, and then just you know fiddle with it and you feel it lock, and then you can close the jaw here. And that is now quite secure. Now, the other interesting thing about this particular clamp is that you can have it in three different orientations. So we can drill a hole in this surface here with the clamp standing upright on the drill press table, or you can turn it through 90 degrees, clamp it that way, drill through this face here, or you can go that way. And 
These, uh, these slots here allow you to hold round or square stock and of course you've got the rebates on the other side. Some people call them rabbits. <laughs> I call them rebates. But these allow you to grip flat bar stock as well. So that's, that's pretty much all of the clamp done and in the next episode I'll be making the parts that anchor this to the drill press table. So this casting here will have to have a big concave machined on it because my drill press table is circular. But if you had a square or rectangular drill press table, you just bolt that straight to the side. And these two pieces of steel here, which have been tack welded together, they form the clamping blocks that go down this end of the bar here, and they will grip the bar, stop it rotating, and stop it moving laterally as well. So that's going to happen in the next episode. And then in a follow-up episode, I'll do all of the metal finishing. So we'll parkerize the steel parts, including the jaws. We'll anodize this little aluminium knob here and I'll powder coat the castings. And it'll be finished. So um, I urge you to come along and check out the next video when we sort of get this uh, operating. We'll try it out on the drill press, see how it goes. And uh, for now, it's Preso signing out. See you on the next episode. Stay well. Cheers. Yeah, that's right. That's where you belong. <laughs> <laughs>